Well, that's noon. I guess I should go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for showing up, especially here in the middle of lunchtime. Um, Lenaro Connect were very gracious to give me an enormous amount of time and space, so I'll do my level best to cram as little content to, into it as possible. Uh, but no, seriously, uh, I'm going to talk about performance engineering for ARM supercomputers. My name is John Linford. I run ARM's performance engineering team for HPC. And um, normally when I give this talk, I'm giving it to a room full of HPC experts, people at National Labs or, or something where they're very familiar with supercomputing and they've never heard of ARM before. So I usually start by giving a spiel about what is ARM and what, you know, an IP company and stuff. This time it's a little bit different. I think most of the people in the room are familiar with ARM as an IP com company, as a standards company. Um, they're just not as familiar with supercomputers. Maybe you know generally what the idea is. But I'm going to begin by showing um, some of the key differences between what I consider to be a supercomputer and what you might find in a data center environment, a cloud center, um, some, something of that nature. So first, broadly, uh, definition of a supercomputer. These are national assets. These are the large scale leadership class computing systems that are brought to bear against problems of national interest or problems of great significance worldwide. And one of the key differences between the supercomputers um, and the cloud centers is that there is extremely low latency point-to-point -point communication between cores anywhere in the system. This creates a system which is uh, highly flexible but also very tightly coupled. And it enables it to bring an enormous amount of computing resource to bear against problems in a very coordinated way, in a way that you don't really see so much in the cloud environment. Now, the lines are blurring, of course, but that's the general distinction. If you can take a process and run exactly the same process image on cores that are a football field away, and they can communicate to each other in extremely low latencies, you're probably on a supercomputer. And generally, you're not seeing a lot of users on these things. Um, you might have uh, you know, one or two users at a time who take off significant portions of the machine. So again, in, in contrast to a cloud environment where you see a lot of virtualization and multiple users running a lot of different jobs, supercomputer tends to be allocated by a batch system to one user at a time where he will pick up the entire machine, run one program on it, and with one program simulate something like a flow over a, an airframe, like what I've got here. This is an, an image from NASA Langley. Um, they showed at the supercomputing conference a couple, a couple of years back. Um, National labs and, uh, and industry use these things to solve problems that couldn't otherwise be addressed. ARM is a relative newcomer to the HPC space. Like I said, most HPC people don't know who, who ARM is or what we do. Um, but really, the, the proof point that we all like to point to is the Astra system, which has been mentioned in a few talks at this point. Uh, it is number 156 out of 500 for the fastest computers in the world, and it's built by HPE. So um, the, the, the sort of the name on the box really should be HPE, Marvell, Mellanox, the ARM partners, right? ARM is involved in this system only so much as that we enable those people to deliver on amazing systems. Another example is Isambard. This is one of my favorite HPC systems out here because although it's much smaller than Astra, Isambard is very stable and is being used in production to, re to generate some really cool results like drug research, um, computational um, fluid dynamics research, and, and they're doing a really good job. So this is a perfect example of ARM HPC in production, actually not a, not a science project, actually doing cool stuff right now today. And of course, we're all looking forward to scalable vector extension, SVE. And the first hardware that's going to have SVE will, of course, be the A64FX from Fujitsu. The, this chip is really just a monster of a chip. It's really amazing. I'm, I'm very excited to see the performance numbers coming off of it. It includes high bandwidth memory, which is a big feature for HPC. Most HPC workloads are memory bound. They're somehow relate, you know, limited in performance by how much data you can get in and out of memory. Uh, either in capacity or latency. And um, by attaching HBM to SVE, Fujitsu have created a machine with GPU-like performance characteristics that runs off-the-shelf software that you could run Red Hat on. You could run whatever. You know, as long as it's ported to, to ARM, you just run it, and it goes. It, I think it's fascinating. Um, for example, if you take a look at this benchmark that uh, shows the performance of an incompressible flow simulation, one socket of the post-K 
uh, A64FX is going head to head with a Tesla V100 GPU. That's about a 3x difference in the power consumption between these two systems. That's, a, that's really key, and it's an enormous win, and it shows really the power of attaching wide vectors to high bandwidth memory. So you might ask, you know, what, what's special about this? Well, they're all ARM cores, uh, and there's a lot of ARM systems out there. I've just shown three HPC systems, and two of them have different uh, systems on chip that drive them. How do they stack up? So uh, what I've done here, and I'm sorry you can't read the labels on the lines, but, but um, just, just give it a minute, uh, is I've taken the numbers off the back of the box for these different S S um, systems on chip and drawn a roof line. So this is a, a measure of arithmetic intensity versus theoretical peak gigaflops on the, on the system. And if you take these, you can compare them to different architectures. These are the numbers you're guaranteed not to exceed, right? These are the marketing numbers. This is what you find online. Your, your mileage may vary, but even if you take the best versus the best um, in performance numbers, you're going to see something like the Thunder X2 has higher bandwidth than, for example, an Intel Skylake while having less um, overall floating point compute capacity. So it's giving about a half a teraflop per socket compared to the Skylake's two teraflops per socket. In HPC, this is actually exactly what we want. As I said, most of the workloads tend to be memory bound, so having more bandwidth counts for more than having more flops, which surprises a lot of people. The key benchmark in the HPC space is Linpack, which is a DGEM wrapper, more or less. And so a lot of these systems are built optimized for DGEM. But the reality, the, the, the applications that really make a difference tend to be memory bound. And ARM has been able to address that very nicely in the, the, the Thunder X2 um, by working with Marvell and, and, by, and with Cavium and Broadcom even um, to make sure that this system meets the needs of the customers. If I draw the Fujitsu chip on there, you can see it dwarfs both of these sockets by a good margin at three teraflops per socket and a whopping 1024 gigabytes of bandwidth in the socket. So it's again down to the HBM and um, it puts it head to head with something like a GPU while still in fact being a CPU. So we're not talking about little cores here. These are powerful, you know, 100, 200, 300 watt per socket sy systems. These are not just a, an aggregate of little mobile cores. This is a completely different approach um, to the architecture. So, so how would you program it? How do you take something like an Astra where you have enormous computational resources and you want to write a code for it? Do you need to do something special? And the answer is, in fact, no. Um, your typical HPC environment is really just a specialized Linux environment. So it's going to run Red Hat. It's going to run SUSE. It's going to run Ubuntu. It's going to run all that same stuff. And the reason you can do that is because ARM is a standards company. We define an instruction set. And once you write a code for that instruction set, it runs on anything that implements that instruction set. So I don't care if it's your mobile phone. I don't care if it's your toaster. I don't care if it's your supercomputer. Implement ARM V8, and your code will run. And this means that you can take something like Red Hat, modify it for your supercomputer as necessary, and then just go. And most of the modifications on a supercomputer tend to do with legacy support. Uh, languages like Fortran, extremely important in this space. There are codes developed 30 years ago which have enormous value and cannot be changed. Rewriting these codes in something like C++ is a non-starter. So you need to support these old legacy systems in your modern supercomputer, and you need to make sure that those old legacy codes are performant on your modern supercomputer. This is where performance engineering comes in. How do we take something uh, that needs to be modernized, tweak it, adjust it, and make sure that it maps well onto the existing hardware to get the performance we're looking for? Um, Quick look at some of the HPC software trends out there. Python is rapidly becoming an important language in the HPC space. Um, and there's been a lot of interest in containers, especially re recently. There's, there's some really great work going on with containers in HPC you should keep an eye on. You generally don't see Java. Sometimes you see um, C Sharp or, or, or Java. But really, um, you don't usually see runtime languages like that as, as, as much. You definitely don't see Windows. I've not seen an HPC system running Windows um, or, or Mac OS. Actually, that's not true. Um, I'm a Hokie. I went to Virginia Tech. So we did, in fact, build us a Mac-based HPC system once. A um, bit of a science project, but it happened. So the typical software stack on an HPC system looks like this. Very familiar stuff. You've got an operating system with compilers, libraries, file systems. Really, the only difference, I think, in an HPC software stack between what you might find in the cloud or otherwise, otherwise is, is the middleware. Um, MPI and OpenMP are the two packages you hear most frequently. 
those tend to tie all the different application images into one collective whole, enable process-to-process um, -process communication across nodes and internode, and um, OpenMP is used for multi-threading. Of course, that one is more well-known in the mobile space. It's, it's very popular. <clears throat> Now, because ARM is a standards company, and if you write it once, it'll run anywhere on the ARM, ARM architecture, theoretically, um, it's meant that it's been very easy to port an enormous number of HPC applications, both open source and commercial, to the ARM architecture. So systems like the Astras, the Isambards, the Fugakus out there, they can run a lot of the codes that have been running on x86 for decades just by recompiling. We have this fundamental software substrate implemented, running on ARM, and the rest is just up to building stuff. And that means that even commercial so software um, from companies like Ansys and Altair and LS uh, Dyna are, are working on ARM and, uh, and can be run at scale without any issue. ARM has this goal to do sort of an end-to-end -end integration of you know, ARM everywhere, anywhere compute happens. That's what ARM wants to see. And so from sensors to supercomputers, we'd like to see the ARM instruction set so that that code you run is using the same instruction set all the way through the stack. And I did a little fun, fun little demo of this uh, once where I tried to take an HPC system and effectively attach it to an end device uh, to show in a, in a booth. And what I did is I took a, um, an Apollo 70 server from HPE, which has the Thunder X2 chip in it. So in total, we had um, 112 cores in this box. And I ran a CFD simulation on it using the OpenFoam package. To that, I attached a visualizer called Paraview. And instead of sending it to a local GPU, I used the output from Para Paraview and, and piped it through libjpeg over the network to a tablet, a tablet running Windows 10 on a Snapdragon processor. The cool thing here is that end to end, there is ARM. The whole thing is ARM. We, we've got a supercomputer-like system running a supercomputing application, talking over a network to an end device, which is also ARM. The whole, you know, Intel could disappear from the planet. And this thing would still work. It's really cool, I think, that we actually are seeing this sort of working. Um, and, and it works well. So this is the vision. This is what we're trying to scale out and make real, um, really worldwide. Now, the key here is that it has to be performant. I can't just do this, compile it, walk away, and say, yeah, I've won. I'm going to have to be performant to compete in the HPC space. And that is where we talk about performance engineering. So what does this mean? What, how do you actually go about getting performance from a code? Now, the first thing I want to say is I will be speaking in the context of supercomputers, but this is not limited to supercomputers. As I said, it's the same software substrate. Supercomputers are just a sort of specialization of that. So all the tools I'm presenting, all the methodologies I'm presenting, they work at small scales as well. Use them on 1, 2, 4, 8, 16 cores, I don't care. Use them on your laptop or, or your desktop. Same stuff runs there, same stuff works there, but it scales out. That is the only really real difference. So ARM provides a commercial product for performance engineering. It's called the ARM Alinea Studio. And the ARM Alinea Studio combines two broad categories of tools. First, we've got code generation tools. These are compilers, basically. right? We have a LLVM-based compiler that supports C, C++, and Fortran. And it comes with some performance libraries that I'll go to in detail in, about, in a minute. Those tools only run on ARM. They don't cross-compile. These are ARM on ARM the whole way. You can't even get them for x86. Don't try. They only work on ARM server class silicon. Then there's the performance engineering tools, which are, in fact, cross-platform. So these are debuggers and profilers that are designed to help you get your code from one platform to another and do a comparative apples to apples analysis of how does your code perform on something like a GPU on a power system versus an ARM Thunder X2 based system or a Fugaku system. So I'll go into each one of these. What I'll do is I'll just walk through a little workflow where we would, we would um, imagine that we're porting some code to a supercomputer and we'll see how each one of these tools is used. So the first thing you want to do, you need to compile your code and link it. Right? You've got a pile of source code from someplace. Go make it run. So start with the ARM compiler. This is our commercial compiler. It is usually the proving ground for most optimizations in the LLVM space. It's usually the first touch for that kind of thing. So um, we, we can be very reactive there and help. I'm not on this team, but I can tell you the people who are. So if you have any particular questions about this compiler, I'll do my best, and I can definitely put you in touch with the experts. For all I know, the experts are here in this room. They probably know more than I do. But I know how to use it. So um, my background is an applications engineer, and I would, I would say confidently that using this compiler is very easy, and it generates a good result. 
On the back end, it's LLVM 7. Uh, ARM implements whatever changes need to be uh, made to the compiler and then upstreams back to LLVM community. And it, fulls, it supports auto vectorization um, very well. It, it supports both uh, neon and SVE auto vectorization. And you can do your typical auto vectorizations for things like uh, loops with unknown trip count or um, gather scatter operations um, for uh, you know working with arrays of structures or structures of arrays, different different data layouts. All this stuff, it just works, okay? And it's hard to even make a presentation out of it because it, it does it does its job from an application's perspective. If you do find performance issues with it, please let me know. We'd love to address those. Um, and I've seen some very good presentations already where people are doing work in progress to improve the performance of LLVM on ARM, and this compiler will benefit directly from that work. Another thing ARM does uh, in providing this HPC Performance Engineering Toolkit is it directly addresses the idea of high core counts. We're accustomed, accustomed to systems having dozens and dozens of cores instead of maybe you know two dozen cores. So um, things like the OpenMP runtime library are deliberately optimized for high core counts to take advantage of the LSE atomics whenever possible. And, um, and we see pretty good results in the applications from that. Now before I move away from compilers, I want to make it abundantly clear that although I've told you about a, com a commercial compiler that's LLVM based, GCC is a major compiler in this space and is at least as important. Um, it is a first-class compiler. ARM is the second largest contributor to the GCC after Red Hat, who is, of course, an ARM, ARM partner. So we see uh, an enormous amount of support for GCC on, H on ARM HPC systems. And uh, the performance is usually comparable between the two. The major difference, of course, is that if you have ARM's commercial compiler and you have some esoteric uh, Fortran application that won't work, come to us and we'll get it working. If you have that with GCC, you're going to have to go talk to the GCC community. They may or may not care because you'll be in line with people like Google. So it, it's, it gives you a leg up and there's a little more support from um, going the commercial route. But functionally, they both have their merits and they're both very good compilers. ARM provides performance libraries that work for both GCC or LLVM. Um, these, these libraries provide some of the fundamental math kernels that HPC systems and applications all have in common. Things like basic linear algebra and FFT transform FFTs. Um, so if you take a look at what's available in the ARM performance library um, versus open source packages, we try very hard to make sure that the ARM PL is the best in class for performance. For example, DGEM. DGEM is a fundamental kernel for many HPC applications as well as ML applications and other, others out there. It's just a very important kernel to have. If you compare the RMPL DGEM to um, Bliss and to Open, OpenBlaz, you'll see that we're getting much better performance on a dual socket Thunder X2 system. This is because we have hero coders in Manchester who really know what they do, and they dive in and they, they will work to make sure that every last scrap of performance is squeezed out of that so that we get the very best numbers with this library. Same thing with FFTW. If you look at the scatter chart, I, I quite like this chart. If you are on the line, then ARM PL for that size of FFT is on par with FFTW. Below the line means that size of FFT, FFT is faster with FFTW, and above means ARM PL is faster. So you can see that by having so many dots above the line, for the vast majority of the FFT sizes that we care about, ARM PL is faster, sometimes as much as 6x faster. So the key here, the key takeaway is just use these libraries. Um, they work with LLVM or GCC, that's usually the first step to getting really good performance on your system. Not all the applications use BLAS and FFTW. So what if you are just using um, the more common math functions, the, the exponents, trigonomic func functions, transcendentals, things like that? Um, there is a pre-compiled version of the ARM optimized routines um, called the LibA math that ships with the ARM HPC compiler. If you use the ARM commercial compiler, it's linked in automatically because we have yet to find a real world case where linking against ARM optimized routines does not improve performance over what's available from the OS. So you will always get this by default in using the ARM's uh, compiler for Linux. If you are using GCC, include the dash LA math flag to get these. And the results are, are very compelling, I think. Codes like WARF, which is a very famous weather code, can be as much as 40% faster just by changing your link line to use this math library. So it really counts for something. 
OK, so let's say we've got our code. We've compiled it. We've linked it against the right libraries. We know that it should be performant. We run it, and it explodes. How do we find the problem? Well, usually we need to go and grab a debugger. If you are going to debug a code at 100,000 nodes, please don't use printf, because you won't be able to get anywhere with that. It's going to be extremely difficult, and you're going to spend more time working with your debug system than making any progress. Instead, use a scalable debugger. So ARM Forge includes a product called DDT, which is a scalable debugger. And what you can do is launch your application with 100,000 or 300,000 processes across this enormous system. And DDT will scale out with your application and allow you to pause any process, look at the stack, look at the registers, anywhere in the system. And it does it with an incredibly low overhead. So it's the overhead, uh, runtime overhead and space overhead are perfectly manageable. They have to be. Remember, we're, at H we're in HPC here. There are no margins. We are on the very edge of what's possible in computing. And so you have to be low overhead if you're going to scale out. So DDT actually does a very good job of providing this information without slowing down the application unnecessarily. Some of the things you can do, I mentioned you can switch between processes and threads, but you can do this system-wide. Um, you can also visualize data structures. This has been fun. I've, I've sat with more than one physicist who their code was running, but it was giving the wrong answer. And if you visualize that data structure and you're an applications expert, you can see, oh, hey, this, the shape of my result is incorrect. Maybe my solver residual is not converging as quickly as it should or something like that. These visualizations help so not only with correctness of the, of the code, making that thing actually run, but generating the right result as well. You can also pair up um, pending communications. So sending messages all over these systems, if you've got hundreds of thousands of nodes, Keeping track of who's talking to whom and why and what data they're sending can be extremely difficult. DDT will allow you to pause the application and see, OK, who's talking to whom, where, why, uh, and, and draw that out in a, in a nice uh, chart to help you find the, the problem quickly. Um, fun fact, some, a lot of these charts look like the sparsity matrix for CFD. So if you do it and you look at that, you'll, you're using something like a finite difference scheme. The, um, the, the uh, communications matrix for the code will look like what you drew probably in, in your mind when you were charting this thing out. That's always fun to watch. Um, so it can tell you th things like which process is mi misbehaving. And, and then when you know which process is misbehaving, you can pause execution, go into the source code, and actually read the source code, read this, the line of source code that's causing the problem. Um, and there's some great demos about that online with lots of uh, videos and blogs available on the ARM website that'll show you exactly how to do that and then how you can use the various visualizations to find that problem and resolve it. <clears throat> it also supports memory debugging. Now, because we run close to the edge with HPC, if there's a memory leak, that can really uh, be difficult to debug. Let's say you have a very small memory leak and your code runs for a week. Runtimes in HPC are often days and weeks. That is not unusual. So even a small leak will generally kill you over time. You can use the debugging features in DDT to look at where memory is being allocated, deallocated, or leaked, and find those. There's a nice slider where you can choose between fast and thorough. When you get to thorough, you're looking at sort of Valgrind level overhead. So, so please don't try to scale that one out. But if you're on fast, you're just looking for leaks and, and small problems. That one does scale out fairly well. OK, so let's say I've, I've run my code. I've debugged my code. Now I know it works. How much performance am I leaving on the table? I've got this enormous machine that costs millions of dollars in electricity to run. I would like to turn it off as quickly as possible. Let's make it go really fast. So how do you characterize performance, and what do you do with that information? So at a high level, generally, if you're going to optimize the performance of an application, you follow a workflow something like this. Begin by profiling your code. Now, I don't really care what profiler you use. I'll get into that in a minute. But get a good understanding of where your code is spending time. I cannot tell you how many times I've sat with an application engineer, and they're a physicist three ways to Sunday, and they say, I wrote this code. I know exactly what it's doing. And then you take a profile of it, and they say, well, that's weird. Shouldn't be spending time there. I wrote this math. It shouldn't be spending time there. And then you go and find out that, well, you know, you, you, you are a great physicist, but you could learn a bit about coding. It doesn't spend time where you thought it spent. And so always start with a profile. After you get your profile, focus on one aspect of the application's performance. 
And I've suggested a few here, file I.O., communications, memory, and compute. And the orange numbers I'm showing, these are the slowdowns that I've personally observed when that aspect of performance is done badly. So if you are doing file I.O. and you choose a, a, a bad way to do it, maybe it was convenient to program, but it's not good for your system, it's quite reasonable that you'll see a 50x slowdown in your application runtime. That happens. Versus compute, if you do something badly in the way you're, you're computing a number, you might see a 2x slowdown. So pick an aspect of the application's performance, focus on that aspect, and tune it until you're satisfied before moving on to the next one. And, and these are the ones I suggest you approach. Continuously profiling and optimizing, profiling, optimizing, until you know that you're where you should be. Those roofline charts I showed at the beginning of the talk are a good tool for knowing when you've reached maximum performance. If your code is achieving the theoretical compute peak or theoretical bandwidth peak the, for your system, stop working. You've got it. You're there. Um, even if you're within 10% of that number, you're doing fantastic. So, um, so take a look at that and then f optimize until you hit the, the right number. Now, how do you profile this stuff? Profiling on a supercomputer is challenging because of the scale. I can't dump a memory trace for 100,000 cores. I will be eating up many petabytes of data in a few seconds. So you have to think about a high-level profiler that can scale out and statistically figure out where code is being spent or where code is spending time and how you might deep dive into that part of the application. So start at a high level with a scalable profiler like ARM's map profiler. Map won't let you dive into a particular process or tease out the individual threads, but it will give you a statistical picture of where the application is spending time across the entire system, where memory is being allocated across the entire system. And then you can zoom in on the particular kernels that are showing up in Map and take a really good look at those maybe with a, a community tool. So it is a sampling-based profiler. That means it periodically looks at the program counter to determine what is going on in your system and then build a statistical picture of where the code is spending time. It supports C, C++, Fortran, and Python, and it's just gener generally used for hotspot analysis. You try to figure out where code is spending time and then go deep with, uh, with, with uh, wherever that hotspot might be. It's a lossy sampler, so over time it will throw away samples. If it detects that it's spending the same time in the same operation for a long time, it'll throw away those additional samples to save space. And this means that it does scale out very well. It can give you time, it can give you hardware performance counters. Um, if you're on an x86 system, you're going to get a different set of performance counters from an ARM system. And in fact, among ARM systems, you're going to get different sets of performance counters because ARM is just an instruction set. Marvell, Fujitsu, and Ampere, they each have their own PMUs, performance monitoring units. So you are going to get different data across the different socks. What the map developers do is they look at sort of a common set of, of counters across all these platforms, and then they select the ones that are most meaningful on each platform. So that when you run on a, a Marvell chip or an x86 or a Power or an Ampere or what have you, you don't get exactly the same data, but you get data that helps you build the same picture. Uh, so you will see things like time spent in the vector unit, time spent, uh, number of accesses to the L2 cache, number of misses in L2 or last level, um, branch instructions, stalled cycles in the front end or the back end, and then you can tie these, um, these different metrics together to figure out why it is stalling or why you might be missing in so many times in L2. Python is supported in map. Uh, generally, Python is used in HPC as a glue language. We'll have a high-level Python wrapper that calls C++ or Fortran underneath. Um, if you're doing pure Python, there are better profilers out there. But if you're in a mixed language situation like that, MAP is a great choice. There are not a lot of good Python profilers that scale out and do mixed language. It's a very challenging problem. And the guys uh, building MAP have done it pretty well. Now, one thing MAP can't do is tell you if performance is good or bad. So it can tell you where the hotspots are. It can tell you, you know, how, how quantitatively how much time is being spent or how, how hard the hardware is working. But is that good performance? To figure out if it's good, you usually have to rely on human intuition and expertise. One thing that can help is using something like a reporting tool. An ARM uh, performance reports is one example. This tool will take the output file from MAP and do a bunch of analysis to figure out 
if your code is memory bound, if it is compute bound, if it is bound by time spent in communication, and then it will generate a very nice HTML report saying in plain English, your code is compute bound. It is spending a lot of time in the vector units. You should do this, that, and the other to improve performance, and so on. And it's generally a great way to find the hotspots and get started on your optimization if you're not too sure when you open that map profile and you're like, I, I'm not entirely sure what this means. Run it through the performance reports and you'll get a, get a little bit of help. You can cover things like uh, SIMD parallelization. It'll tell you about time spent in OpenMP runtime overhead. Funny thing, um, a lot of scientists think pound pragma OMP parallel four means go very fast and they just slap it everywhere. Um, that doesn't actually work. So what you want to do is uh, try to use this, uh, you know, minimize the number of parallel regions you actually spawn. And if you're doing too many of those, you can usually see that show up in the OpenMP runtime overhead in the performance report. All the screenshots and stuff I've shown so far, you'll notice they're from a GUI. They're not from a command line tool. This is a graphical tool that runs, you know, in, in your X windows or wherever. So how do I run it when I'm on a remote supercomputer? You don't walk up to the supercomputer and plug in your monitor, obviously. So how do I do, how do, I do this? Um, you could forward X11. You could use something like VNC. But ARM has a better option where you have a remote client that runs on the local system. So this will run on your laptop or your desktop. It will use your local CPU, memory, and GPU. And then it connects over SSH to the forge process, the DDT or the map or what have you, that's running on the supercomputer. So it's all encrypted. It's all over your typical SSH connection. Um, no special sauce here. You don't have to run any daemons or get root access or anything. If I didn't say it already, you don't get root on supercomputers. That never happens. Um, nobody gets root on supercomputers. So it's a non-starter. Um, with, with Forge, you have this very nice GUI that actually works quite well. Um, so not that long ago, I was on a flight to Australia. And I, was, you know, I wanted to use the Forge GUI on the airplane Wi-Fi. So I, um, you know, I'm at 41,000 feet and 550 miles an hour. And these are my uh, network performance characteristics. They're just terrible. But even in this network environment, I was able to use the remote GUI and, and get my work done. And, and it wasn't excruciating. It actually worked pretty well. And that's why I took the screenshot, because I was kind of amazed at how well the thing was working. Um, so if, I've, I've had people who say, yeah, I can't use a GUI to debug or whatever. It's not true. You totally can. If I can do it over the, over the Pacific Ocean, you can do it from your office. Um, the GUI looks like this. So I want to talk about the next generation. This what, everything I've shown here, these performance tools, they all work very well. They're being used on Astra, on Isambard, on the Catalyst systems all across the UK. Uh, we expect they'll be fully used on the Fugaku system when it fires up. Um, they're, they're solid performance engineering tools. The next thing everybody's expecting, of course, is SVE, Scalable Vector Extension. Again, I'm at an advantage here with this crowd because I usually have to take five to 10 minutes to explain what is SVE. But I think um, most of the people in this room are probably know more about it than I do. Um, just in case you don't, SVE is just a vector instruction extension for the ARM architecture that has no uh, defined vector length. You can choose a vector length of 128 bits up to 2K bits. And the first time I heard about this, I, I called BS. I said, there's no way this thing could work. It certainly can't be performant. Over time and having used it, I'm, I'm kind of amazed. The thing is actually a thing of beauty. It really does work, and it works quite well. Um, encoding that vector agnosticism in the assembly itself, it, making, the, making the very assembly code of the machine unaware of the length of the vector generates some just beautiful code. And it makes it so you don't have to worry about things like drain loops and, and other weirdness in your, in your, um, it, for your compiler to take care of for you. It, it kind of does a good job. Uh, a key feature of SVE, how do you program if you don't know the vector length? Right? I can't say grab the, you know, 28th bit out of this thing. Maybe there isn't one, or 28th byte, I should say, 128 bits. You know there's a 28 bit, but so on. Um, you don't know how long your vector is. How do you cope with a data structure when it's, when it's sizeless? There's a concept of a predicate, and you can just think of a predicate as mapping operations onto vector lanes. So this is, this is an entity that allows you to take a vector, take a predicate, and take an operation and say that these operations will apply to certain vector lanes. It's not a bet mask. It's more complicated and more powerful than a bit mask. Um, but you can, in some situations, it, it fills the same purpose. Um, a, a little mental exercise that helps me understand SVE is that if I had to compute 
a piece of data that has 10 chunks of eight bytes, how would I go about it? And I tend to like to think about things in the terms of drinking. Um, I don't know about you, but that's certainly my go-to. So with a scalar architecture, you might take your data, and you can think of it as 10 little eight-byte shots. I could use an eight-byte register 10 times. With a fixed width vector, inst vector instruction set, I could use my vector register four times, and then I have a little bit of a remainder left that doesn't quite fit in the vector. So I'll use a drain loop and switch back to the scalar architecture to wrap that up. With a vector length agnostic architecture like SVE, you get to fill the glass how full you need it to be, right? So you can fill the glass half full or half empty if you're a pessimist. You pick how much water goes in the glass in the last iteration. And you never have to change the size of the glass. The predicate actually controls how much data is operated on in that last iteration. That's enough about SVE. I think everybody knew that already, but I should cover it just in case. Um, how do you actually program the thing? Well, um, I always recommend first, don't write code if you can avoid it. Go grab libraries. The geniuses over in Manchester have already implemented BLAS, LATPAC, and FFTW kernels in, with SVE in the ARM Performance Library 19.3. That's been released recently, so there is an SVE-enabled high-performance computing math library out there that you can use today. It does exist. Please go try it. Um, if you are going to write co code, use compiler auto-vectorization. So GCC, ARM compiler for Linux, Cray compiler, and Fujitsu compiler can all generate code. They can all auto-vectorize for SVE. And they all understand the typical directives for vectorization. You can use your OMP Parallel 4. You can use your vector always. These things work. There's also some um, Clang directives you can use if you're on an LLVM compiler. If libraries and auto vectorization are not quite cutting it for you, there are intrinsics. The ARM C language extensions uh, for SVE will allow you to write SVE code with compiler intrinsics. And here's where the value of SVE really becomes apparent. Because if you are coming from a fixed length vector instruction set world, you know that you have to rewrite that code every time there's a change in the vector architecture. The next generation of the vendor's chip, you have to go rewrite all your code because now the vector is bigger or whatever. With SVE, you never have to rewrite that code if you don't want to. It will run on the future, on the different sized vector, uh, vector units because the width of the vector unit is not hard coded into the instruction set. Even when you're using intrinsics or assembly language, that's the same assembly language, the same intrinsic will run on vector units of any length. Pretty incredible stuff. So you can still go to the intrinsic level, and you're going to lose less with SVE than you would lose if you were going to a fixed width instruction set. When are these features available? So there's two kinds of SVE out there. There's SVE and there's SVE2. SVE2 is to bring SVE um, uh, functionally on par with Neon. Um, there's a good talk about this on Tuesday. Slides are in the schedule. If, if you need help finding them, I'll, I'll point you to it. But the bottom line is there's SVE and there's SVE2. Both of them are completely supported in our ARM compiler for Linux. Works just great. We are working hard with, all the, with the LLVM community to get SVE2 supported in LLVM 10 and in LLVM 11 for auto vectorization. Um, you know, small, small warning here on the yellow boxes. These are planned. This is work in progress. Things always happen. But this is our expectation if all goes well. And of course, um, GNU compilers as well. GNU um, supports SVE auto vectorization now, and we're hoping to see it fully supported in GNU 10. I don't know any reason why it wouldn't be. This box is green. Um, Fujitsu compiler, Cray compiler, they have their own roadmaps. Generally, they support SVE very, very well. Fujitsu, as I said, makes the S only SVE hardware out there at the moment. So they know more about SVE compilers pretty much than anybody in, in a certain sense. They actually have hardware to run it on, which is nice. How do you use these compilers to generate code? It's very easy. With the GNU compiler or the ARM compiler, just do a plus SVE on your architecture spec. So you do march equals ARM whatever plus SVE, if it's not already implied in that architecture, right? Um, it will generate SVE instructions. It might also generate NEON. Um, it will definitely um, give you SSE whenever possible. And you can always use the assembly code to double check that SSE has been generated. SVE, excuse me. SSE is a different thing. SVE. How do you run this stuff? SVE hardware is here but nobody has access to it outside of Fujitsu at the moment. Um, we're all expecting it to be broadly accessible within 
soon. Um, but you know, at the moment, if you want to run this SVE code, how do you go and do it? There's actually a lot of ways you can do this. QMU supports SVE. Um, there are tools like fast models and cycle models that support SVE. One that works very well in the HPC space is the ARM Instruction Emulator. And ARM Instruction Emulator works well in the HPC space because most of the um, instructions that go through ARMY are not emulated. ARMY works on ARM chips, and it only works on ARM chips. And when it's executing a binary, when, excuse me, when it's emulating a binary and it hits a instruction that is not available in the native architecture, it translates that instruction to something that the native architecture does support. So it might be scalar, it might be neon, who knows. But the point is that most of those instructions are going to be executed at native speed on the native hardware. And that allows you to scale out very well um, even when your application is SVE. So I've used this uh, ARM instruction emulator to run on you know, a dozen or so MPI processes, each with a, with a few dozen OpenMP threads, and get some pretty representative performance information out that allows me to get a good understanding for how this thing will perform at scale on a machine that has SVE. Generally, um, a fun little way to make sure that your compiler is actually generating SVE, if you're on something like a Thunder X2 where SVE is not available, um, just run it and look for the illegal instruction. Right? because you'll hit an SVE instruction that the native architecture doesn't understand. Then put ARMY in front of it, and you'll see that it does, in fact, run. ARMY, it's important to understand what ARMY is and isn't. So it is fast. It's functional. It will tell you exactly if your code, if it's, if it's giving the right answer or not with SVE. That's a fairly important point. And it, it is easy to use, and it's free to, free to use. It's not open source at the moment, but it is, um, you don't need a license to run it. You can just download it and run it and go. It's not cycle accurate. And it can tell you nothing about the runtime of your application. Think about this a little bit. If I have a code that's, emu if I have a tool that emulates SVE instructions, the more SVE ha I have, the more emulation it's having, the slower it's going to run. I've seen people, frustrated people, who have, co have come to me where they put the time command in front of their army command line and then said, I used SVE and my code was 10x slower. And I say, that's good. Right? It means you're emulating more. It means you're actually getting more SVE. And they're expecting it to just run faster. It won't run faster. And if anything, if you're doing things right, it will run slower. And the timing information that comes out of ARMY is, is not meaningful. It's not tied to the hardware. So don't try to use it for runtime and understanding. It's not a simulator. And it doesn't really have a good understanding of the architecture underneath. It's good for checking functionality, and it's good for getting a general sense of how the application instructions are, are how, how the compiler is generating instructions in your, for your particular application. So one thing ARMY can do is uh, it can use clients to, to do a general type of analysis, um, pretty much anything you can imagine. You can write your own clients, and a couple of them ship with ARMY. So we have a memory tracing client that will take a look at what memory uh, addresses are accessed by your code. It can tell you how many gather operations or scatter operations were executed in your code. And it can be used to generate a trace that feeds into a simple um, uh, memory hierarchy uh, simulator to see if uh, your application is using the cache effectively. You know, if it generally get a good sense for data movement by SVE. There's also an opcode counter and an instruction counter client. These will tell you exactly how many instructions of a certain type are being uh, executed, so you can see the breakdown between scalar, neon, SVE, and different types of each of those. Going from that data alone is usually enough to get a fairly good idea of the kind of performance gains you would get in your application for particular hardware implementations for those instructions. It, it can be done. It's not easy, but it can be done. So just a summary of this. There's a very good blog out there that will walk you through how to use ARMY, uh, how to use the different instruction, um, it, it, the different uh, instrumentation clients, and I uh, recommend you, you start there if you want to get uh, your hands on this stuff. There are uh, these special magic instructions you, you can use to mark regions of interest. I do suggest you use those if you're going to do memory tracing especially. It, the, the memory trace files can be quite large. So you want to focus on the regions that you identified as important, maybe with MAP, for example. Put those in, and ARMY will only focus on that piece of the application code. So I want to wrap up with a few resources to help you get started. I've shown a real buffet of what's out there, right? There's compilers, libraries, tools, debuggers, profilers, emulators, 
All this stuff is available um, through the ARM website, through our partners' websites, and we have some great communities around these tools and around these efforts uh, where the experts themselves what might, might answer you. They tend to be very friendly people. So if you go look, for example, at this um, AHUG collaboration website, this is a group's website, mailing lists and wikis and things like that, where some of the leaders in the field are actively participating, telling others what they're working on, what their issues are, and, and they can help you if you have any questions. It's a good place to start. Um, we also have a lot of blogs and a forum that you can use. If you want to get your hands on ARM systems, if you don't have access to an ARM supercomputer at the moment, um, you can always ask for access to the Isambard system at Bristol. This one is open and generally available. Um, I, you can also ask for any of the Catalyst systems. So these are single rack, HPC class, um, I would call them pre-production systems, available at EPCC, Leicester, and Bristol. And we're going to see more of this hardware available in the very near future. But if you're impatient, start here. Either one of those links will get you going. I had a pretty cool video to wrap up with about a, a nuclear bomb going off on an asteroid, but I'm going to go ahead and skip it. If you want to see this, um, well, you know what, let's push, push play. I don't know if the sound is going to come through. So this is the kind of work that is being done at Los Alamos National Laboratory. This is not done on ARM. My dream is to see this stuff done on ARM. Right now, this was done on x86 on a very large cluster. And they're simulating the idea of an asteroid coming down to the planet, and it's going to exterminate all life on the planet. So instead of calling up you know, a bunch of oil guys, we're going to go put a nuclear bomb on the surface, blow it up, and see what happens. And this is simulating a, a, a device detonation right on the surface of the asteroid and tracking all the performance characteristics around that, what actually happens to the asteroid, what happens um, when the weapon goes off. So it's, it's a fascinating study, and this is the kind of stuff the HPC is addressing that I'd love to see ARM doing at scale, and, and I think in very near time we will be, so it's very exciting stuff. That's it for me. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take your questions. It's also lunchtime, so don't feel like you have to sit here. Uh, I would run out and grab a sandwich if I were you. Thank you. Um, yes. Library, we can download it. What's the license for that? Good question. Um, I'll skip that. Uh, our performance library is closed source commercial software. There is, you do have to purchase a license to, to use it, but you don't have to have a license to run applications that are linked against it. Um, you just wouldn't, wouldn't be able to build a code. Um, I think there's also some restrictions around distributing it. Uh, I'm not sure exactly, but it's not open source.